Welcome to Tales of Blue, episode 30, where I'm joined by a man who's simply seen it all. In over 30 years service at the club, which saw him oversee 14 managers, four promotions, four relegations, a Wembley playoff final, while treating some of the best players ever to pull on the City shirt. A warm welcome to Roy Bailey. So Roy, a lot of the City faithful know you as the legendary physio, but your City story started much earlier, 69-70, as an apprentice at the club. Yeah, I came uh, from Alton and myself, Cheshire boys, and the late Harry Godwin spotted me uh, playing another game against Manchester boys. And um, he offered me uh, an apprenticeship, and about six months, seven months into it, I was playing at Cheetah, the old training ground, and um, I twisted my knee and I thought a lad was going to kick me. And um, I knew he'd done something bad to my knee. And he ended up having a cartilage operation. And in those days, they didn't have the technology or, or that sort of stuff as they do today. And I was put in a plastic cast. And cut a long story short, I ended up breaking down a couple of times. And then I went to Chesington to a rehabilitation centre for two years. And never made a recovery, really. Mm. Uh, for the two years, I was doing great. And then all of a sudden, I banged my knee one day in one of their gyms. And um, I had to pack up. Yeah, so you tried a different job, but a call came again from City <laughs> to come back. Yeah, uh, I did try a different job. It was working on a motorway on the uh, on the M62 um, through my, my sister's boyfriend at, at that time, and I got a telegram off um, my love Joe Joe Mercer saying uh, they want me to come back to the club, and I was a bit reluctant really because um, football is the only thing I've ever wanted to do, and to. To have that snatched away from me was uh, was terrible. So, but I went back. And my dad encouraged me to go back. He said, "Go back to Roy, back to City." And he and it was Joe Mercer and Mal said, "And um, we want you to we want you to look after the first team, buy you with the kit, the boots, um, and work alongside the physio." At that time was Peter Blakey. Um, so I said, "Right, okay." He said, but that means you, you travel everywhere with the first team. Look after the first team, everything you want. You make sure it gets a bit like what Chappie did. Yeah. Um, which they encouraged. And then I worked alongside the physio, as I say. And I did that. And I've, I've been fortunate. You know, out of the other person, so not being there for it. I've been, I've flew all my life. And I've travelled the world. And I've seen some great people. I've worked with some great people, some not too good, some not too bad, but uh, on the whole it's been a, a fantastic journey. You certainly had a front seat view of what went on for, for decades and decades. I, I know this fellow was a little bit before your time at the club, but was obviously also there when you went on, and I know you went on to become great friends with... Yeah, I mean... <laughs> in number eight speaks for itself. It so, does, yeah. Uh, the materials change, but... Whenever I see the number eight, it's, uh, it's very special, you know, called, uh, well, I do get a bit emotional about yeah. it. Um, but yeah, he's, uh, he, was, he was a great player and we got very, very close, obviously, because of the injury he sustained against United um, and the rehabilitation part of it, uh, where we were morning, afternoon and night time. And one of my main jobs was to pick him up from his house. At, okay. He used to live in a place called Rose Mill Lane in, in Hale. And he, because he couldn't walk, um, I used to pick him up every morning, bring him into the club. He used to have his treatment, physiotherapy, and then he used to do some rehabilitation. And then he had some lunch. Then we'd do the same at the, uh, the afternoon. And then he was back at night time. And he used to take him home at night time. So over the two or three years that Cole was out, we can became very very close friends you know he certainly um, put the hours and the effort in to get yeah back i mean he, he was he was unbelievable he was it's the fittest i've ever been and the guy that was was the physio then uh freddie griffiths he was a he was a fit bloke um he run us into the ground all around main road moss side northern jersey we would pound the roads trying to get this guy fit um but at the end of the day he never recovered from his uh, from his knee injury. I know he made a few comeback games, but there's the game sort of he's remembered for literally coming back. He had played a little bit before that Newcastle Boxing Day. Yeah. What well, do you remember the atmosphere of that? Oh, it was 
it was unbelievable. Uh, the place was packed, and we knew that uh, he was going to come on at some stage during the game, but uh, we didn't know when. Mm. Uh, and I get, I get that tingling feeling, you know, when you see somebody special coming back. Yeah. Uh, but you could tell Cole wasn't the same. And before his injury, he was this free-flowing, unbelievable athlete that would get up and down the pitch and he would tackle, he would head the ball, he'd kick with his right, kick with his left. He could do everything. Um, he, was a, he was a special person. You know, during his rehabilitation, he's... Uh, we had a we had a squash player coming, friend of Fred's, and uh, a couple of a world champion called Jonah Barrington, and um, he wanted to pay us after we got his ankle uh, sorted out for him, and Cole was part of the rehabilitation, so Cole said, no no we don't need any money, let's go on the court, and he picked the racket up, he never played squash in his life, and he was hitting the ball, he was just going over the tin, and this Jonah Barrington said. Never seen a person pick a racket up and hit it as well as Colin did. Fantastic, fantastic stuff. There's some great players around at that time, boys. Yeah, of course. You know, there must have been like a kid in a sweet shop at yeah. that time. It's number nine, Francis Lee wore this yeah, shirt. Yeah, I know. I'm other. very close to Fran as well. You know, I may have been close to all that team. Uh, but there was a closeness at yeah, the club. Yeah, it, it's you, you don't often see it, but I think you know, as we discussed prior to this, you know, Pep's seems to have got that love and passion for the club for the team and everybody who bought into it well i've seen that three or four, three times in my the whole of my career when i first started looking after these people franny and Carl and mike and bucky and all and and, and Oki, um it was like that then mm. it was like that then it was just unbelievable every game you went out you think we would win but yeah um they're bringing back some fantastic memories for me, Mark. You know, it's just, uh, it's fantastic. Good little striker in his day as well, obviously, Francis. Yeah, he was. He could uh, get yeah, penalties. He, he was, he was yeah, chubby, yeah. but he wasn't chubby, was he? No, he no, no, he, he wasn't. Um, I always remember um, a manager, it was short lived, really. He was only there, um, I think he was only there just over uh, a season. Uh, Ron Saunders. And uh, we all was introduced to him one day, and his first day he came in in the dressing room. All the first team was sat there, and I was sat there. P uh, Fred York, Peter Blake, and Fred was there. And uh, he turned around and he said, "Good morning, Fatty," to Franny. Yeah. <laughs> and we just looked at him and just thought, "No," because Franny wasn't. He wasn't an ounce of fat on him. Yeah. He was just muscle, and uh, he just got off on the wrong foot. Yeah, that wasn't the best start <laughs> no. at all. But these, these, so that's Willie Donaghy. Yeah. I mean, another player who had that longevity at the club would then be there, you know. Great, later great when servant, there. yeah, great servant to the uh, uh, to the club, Willie. Um, spent a lot of time with Willie. Um, you know, obviously when he played and then he then he, he left the club and then he came back with Joe, obviously, as his, um, his assistant manager in the latter time at Lyle uh, at Main Road. Um, and still one of the fittest lads, even then. He amazes me, Willie. Yeah, every time I see him, he looks a little bit older in the face when I speak to him, but he's still fit. Um, he's not let himself go in any way. Well, there's never, there was never a chance of that anyway because he was he was a fitness nut. He's still, um, he's still yeah. fit in that today, no problem, wouldn't he? I, I think, think so, really. yeah. yeah. <laughs> These players, they gave the club longevity. Another guy, Tommy Booth, number five, I'm sure. You remember Tommy well? Yeah, Tom's. Uh, yeah, he's another one of my favourites as well. He was, uh, you know, I often see him at the, at the game, and um, he's he was a super bloke, very very dry witted. Tom, you had to be careful what you said to him. <laughs> it was a bit like Oki. Uh, if you didn't know him, and you said something to him, then he would cut you into pieces. But uh, a lovely bloke. He always used to. He always used to wind big Joe. Uh, that was that was his favourite trick, I think. Well, out, out of anybody in the team that could wind Big Joe up. I was going to say, I wouldn't have said that was the greatest big... idea to wind Big no, Joe up. No, <laughs> definitely not. No. But yeah, Big Tom, great memories of me. And probably a better player than he's given credit for. Yeah, yeah, yeah he was uh, he was steady Eddie at the back along the doily, you know. Um, and I, I can always remember him 
well, I wasn't there then getting to the getting to the uh, the FA Cup final against Leicester his goal he scored yeah. in the semi final but yeah a great character and a great servant to the club so the players were coming thick and fast in that time there's a lot of young lads coming through Gary Owen Peter Barnes yeah Gary and Peter used to be like uh, Attached at the hip, uh, I always remember. Um, I think it was their debut um, for England. I think it was in Italy at, at Wembley Stadium, and they asked Barnes if for a couple of tickets. And a friend of mine who's who's passed now, uh, used to work for Umbro. Said, "Come on, we'll drive there on the Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon." And that. And I always remember. I get into the ground, and uh, it's packed, absolutely packed. And there's two seats spare next to me. And I'm thinking, who's going to sit in these seats? And I, and I looked down to the very bottom just near the pitch. And Big Ellen was walking along the front <laughs> seats. And I thought to myself, I said to Mike, the lad that was with us, I said, Mike, he ain't going to believe he's going to be sat next to us. <laughs> and it was, it was Big Ellen with a bell. It wasn't a quiet evening. It then. wasn't, no. <laughs> she rang the bell for the whole nine minutes. But uh, God love her. She was uh, another favourite of the crowd, yeah. you know. I know you touched on Big Joe, but a, but a shout of his. Well, I mean, you used to work I, with Joe regularly. I'm, yeah, I pick it up and I thought, he'll never, he would, he'd never get in that now. <laughs> but he could at the time. Yeah, I used to be. Well, Joe was my best man at uh, my wedding. Uh, so, obviously, I'm very close to Joe. Uh, yeah, but this reminds me so much of the days we used to spend together. And before the games, any game at... Um, in a game we played in, we always liked to do a little bit of goalkeeping, the mandolin, before the game. So we used to go, if we were playing the main road, we used to get there for about 10. We'd do about three quarters of an hour of a, a ball session, catching and saving and this, that and the other. Even away games we used to do. One day we did that on an island in the middle of the road. But uh, that's another story. But uh, yeah, a lovely, lovely bloke. Still, being, still in touch with him. He's keeping well. I believe he's just had a hip replacement. So... But yeah, didn't like get didn't like getting chipped too much, Big Joe. No, no, I remember um, we signed a lad called uh, Peter Bodak from uh, Coventry, and uh, about two weeks before we played him at Coventry at uh, Main Road in the Cup, and this Peter Bodak broke down the right hand side just in front of the tip axe. And Joe come out and he chipped him, and as he chipped him, the ball went in the back of the net, and he swung his finger at Joe, and I thought. Oh, you don't do that to Big Joe. And about a week later, we signed him. And uh, <laughs> I can remember going in on the Monday morning. Big Joe must have realised who it was. And he was lying on the floor in the corner holding his shoulder. <laughs> so I think he got pretty paid for doing that. <laughs> so I reminded him. <laughs> so 81, 80, 81 season, since John Bond come in and influx of players, Gary yeah. Gow, Tommy Hutchinson. Yeah, so, as I mean, as soon as, as soon as I picked that up, I, I thought of Tommy Keynes, funny enough. God bless him. Uh, yeah, God, God bless him. He was a great lad. Tommy. There's a good mix of youth. Yeah. Kate, Kate and Nicky Reed, Ray Ranson yeah. coming through with the yeah. experienced lads. And we, when Bond came, we just took off. We got to the FA, obviously, to the FA Cup final, but we, we had to keep changing the team. Mm. Due to the lads being cup tied. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I remember it was Buckley and... There was one or two others um, that played it in the semi-final against Liverpool. Alf Gray. This is the League Cup. Yeah, this is the League Cup, um, and we got we 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 got thrown out of the cup, uh, the League Cup. But he signed three most important players we've ever signed. I think at that time it was Tommy Hutchinson, Jerry Gow, and Bobby Mack. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And we just took off. It was just unbelievable. But there again, it was one of those. It was one of those teams that they did everything for each other. They loved each other. They were everywhere they went. You could never, even if, like when I used to sort the the, um, the roomy list out, I could just mix it up. I don't have to keep them like Tommy with Nicky Reed or somebody like that and their favourite players. They just go with whoever. It was a happy camp. It was a happy camp. Because there have been big changes, obviously. Yeah. We had a good side under yeah. Tony Book, yeah. which then Big Mal came back. Broke things up, didn't exactly. quite work as we all yeah. know the story. So John Bond brought a bit of stability. Yeah, back we, in. I mean, we got to the cup final. It was that was fantastic. I, I remember Mackin should have put it to bed then, but he, he just shaved the post. But 
when they when they got the free kick, their goal. I mean, a good Ipswich side, Roy, in them days. Yeah, they did. Okay. Yeah. I don't, which one are you talking? The semi final. Oh, the semi final. Sorry, yeah. Um, Ipswich had a great great team, yeah, and then Paul Power, who called the goo because of his eyesight, you know, uh, put one in the top corner. And I always remember banging my head on the tunnel in um, uh, in the dugout in uh, Aston Villa. Where you used to sit below the ground, you know. But yeah. How great, was, how was the dressing room in that semi final? Extra time, the legs oh, must have been tired. It was I'm unbelievable, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. You've been back that, on them days, right? That was when they used to, you know, crack the champagne open and all that sort of stuff and have a drink after the games. And But it's different now, you know, it really is different. The Wembley comes in 81. Oh, God, heaven. That's Kevin Reeves' shirt from the final. I mean, we were the better team. We should have won it on the Saturday. But. Um, I believe Jerry Gow was told to keep well, no, what, happened, what happened, yeah, he, he was told to keep our dealers quiet. But what happened was they got a free kick and Uchi went into the wall. And Bondi and Bella was on the bench, sat next to him. And he said, who's still into getting the wall? So he said, get him out of the wall now. Get him out of the wall now. If it had stayed in the wall and you stood up, Big Joe would have saved it, but he didn't. And as he come out the wall, he did that, and the ball hit shoulder and went in the opposite corner. So it was Bondi's fault we lost. Yeah. So, so did, go down, did the lads go down to Wembley the night before for the first final? The, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the Wembley trip was, uh, I think we, we went down on the Thursday. We played. We stayed at a place called Sampson Park. Beautiful hotel, lovely grounds, and we trained, and it was lovely. Um, and then the... The, the obviously the, it was the hundredth cup final and you know cup final day was it's a special day helicopters all over all red we had police bikes all around the coach and we were all in our nice suits and this that and the other um days you never forget yeah days you never ever forget and the players that played i'll never forget um tommy kane ray rance and nicky reed and you know, it goes on. These these people are just fantastic for me. Yeah, lovely, great memories. So the first sponsorship comes in on the shirts, 82-83 with Saab. This is number 10, another big pal of yours, Ace of Heart for the Blue. Yes, I always keep in contact with Ace. He's a, he's a, he's a super bloke, super, uh, super player. Uh, I always thought he was one of the best midfield players that ever played for City. And I told him so as well. Um, he was his birthday not too long ago. They asked me to do a, a little recording to him. And I says, you know, when when he came from West Brom, mm -hmm. he just he just automatically get, started to play. And you could see he was one of them gutsy little lads. And he gave everything for the shirt, you know, Ace he did. But this, as soon as you brought that out there, it reminded me of... Um, the Saab day when we, we announced we was going to Saab and uh, we had an old comedian, he's long gone now, Bernard Manning did the, the presentation yeah. and all that for it. Uh, the cars were on the pitch. The cars were on the pitch. Big, big sponsorship game it, at the it time. Was. Yeah, we all had Saabs and um, Kevin Bond was playing, I remember, and uh, yeah. I mean, season doesn't end too well. No. Other than town, when we needed a, no. a draw to stay up. No, that's one of the sad, sad times at, uh, in my career at City. Because uh, John Bond had gone sort of earlier on. Did John Benson take over for the remainder ben, of the ben season? Ben took but over as caretaker manager, yeah. Um, John left and left um, John Benson in charge. Well, he didn't leave him in charge. Uh, the chairman did, Swales. Um, and yeah, we, we got relegated. And it was a very sad time for the club. So we drop into the second division. Billy McNeil comes Sadly, in. Sadly, yeah. A bit more Scots players coming in, signing. Yeah, we had uh, lots of Scots players when Billy arrived. The season really sort of consolidated in 83, 84. Mick McCarthy comes in at yeah. centre half as yeah. well. Tommy Cason goes to Arsenal. Then the following campaign in 84, 85, we were doing okay. Then we started to. Stumble towards the end, losing at Knox County away. Do you remember that one, Roy? There was I think it, was it was it three one? I think three one or fans, three two, and a few fans were the fans were ripping. I can remember ripping all the fencing down. They're trying to get at. Don't know what they're trying to do. They were just frustrated. They were angry. Just offer a bit of encouragement. Exactly. <laughs> but what brings it back to that was I think Jimmy Cyril was the manager. He went onto the pitch and said, "Everybody try to calm down." Da -da. So did Billy. And at the, 
the very end of the game, we all goes into the dressing room. There's, there was there was no security. That's it. And uh, I remember four City fans, big burly chaps, bursting into the dressing room. And Nicky Reed just stood up and he went, "What the? What are you doing in here?" And these two guys picked these two cans of orange and just threw them at him. And they give him the most. Everybody got a burgling off these four City fans, and I thought. That's the passion these people have. Well, it did the job because it we picked up a bit and we went into the last day of the season with Charlton. And this this fella, for us to say he's an umbai, I mean, he came into the team very early under John Bond and then kind of disappeared, went off to Ireland on loan yeah. a little bit, then came back and we sort of reintroduced Paul Simpson. Yeah. So this is his shirt from the Charlton. No, I can't game. believe this is his shirt. Yeah, but fantastic lad. Um, no Simo a long, long time as an apprentice. He, in fact, he used to clean the treatment room. And uh, yeah, it was one, that was one of those special days where I always, I can always remember Swales. He used to say, whatever, whatever crowd we have, never put more than 33,000. He used to say that to Burnley. And uh, the reason being, Players used to get paid, but the Oranges used to get an appearance money as well as a crowd bonus. Okay. Anything over 33,000, you get a crowd bonus. So that's why he used to say, keep it below yeah, 33,000. That day was back. But yeah, too. this was this was Simo's game. Yeah, the, uh, David Phillips and Andy May all brings back all the beautiful memories of him scoring. And the crowd was just unbelievable on that, on that sunny day. Yeah, a fantastic memory. A great lad, Simo. Liked a holiday. Yeah, oh yeah. He, he loved a holiday, but the, as I say, when he was an apprentice, he had to, he didn't have any, he didn't have any money, and he came into the treatment room, uh, into the boot room one day, and I could see he was a bit low. And I said to him, "What's wrong, Simo?" He says, uh, "Oh, the lads have gone on holiday, though, and I've got no money, so I give him some money for holiday, but he still never paid me back." <laughs> Here's a guy who's still around the club now, unfortunately with injury. Yeah, big Alex. He's a lovely chap. Yeah. A great keeper, Roy. Yeah, he was good, Alex, yeah. He worked hard, like Big Joe did, you know. All the keepers we had used to work hard. Uh, big Joe, Keith McCray, Alex, Big Eric, Ronnie Ely, God rest his soul. They were all great workers and they were all, you know, decent goalkeepers. You know, he, uh, another great servant to the club. Uh, I did see him actually when I, I went to a game with Bucky and uh, he, I don't think he recognised me first of all um, but then he realised it was me and he gave me a big old like he always used to do Big hands Big hands, yeah The promotion back under Billy McNeil um, Paul Power leaves the club This is Clive Wilson's shirt from Paul Power's testimonial a uh, richly deserved testimonial he, he played a half for each that afternoon yeah, power did he did yeah paul was a great uh great and another great another great servant to the football club you know um he lives over in well he did live over in france last time i heard off kenny clements and who was a great friend of his you know um but yeah he used to he wanted his nickname was magoo and uh, the reason being his eyesight was pretty poor right. you know uh he used to wear contact lenses and there was a few times when when i was the physio one time I can remember him playing at Liverpool and they kept waving at me and I thought, what's he waving at? And he, he got further, closer and closer to me and one of his contact lenses had come out so he ended up going on and changing his contact lenses. But uh, yeah, great servant, Paul. So that season back in the first division, Mick McCarthy at centre half. What are your memories of Big Mick? Big Mick was a big, big, big Andy lad, you know. Um, yeah, good steady Eddie, good good footballer. Knew what he was going to do. He, he, he wanted to win every single game, Mick. Uh, he used to inspire all, all the lads. Um, Whether it be football or cards, Mick would want to win. <sighs> oh, don't mention cards <laughs> to Mick. I, I always remember them. I don't know if, I don't know whether he's told anybody, but... We were playing, we were playing Watford in, in, a, in a league game, and uh, they were playing cards on the coach halfway down on the left hand side as we drove down. 
uh, and opposite him was Imre Varadi. And Imre was a nice lad. Um, it was a Bernardo's kiddie, so he's a bit of an hard lad, you know. And as we come down the counter, you heard somebody say, you effing cheap. The next thing is, that both of them are scrapping <laughs> over the table, actually punching each other in the face. <laughs> this is before the this game. This is before the game, yeah. So, I mean, it was a great game as well. Some strong characters in. Yeah, very in much so, side. yeah. I mean, yeah. Billy McNeil leaves that season quite early on yeah. to go to Aston Villa. Jimmy Frizzell takes over and yeah. brings in some experienced players. John Gidman comes in. Yeah. In Ray Varadi was signed. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but it's struggled really we, a little bit we, that season. Yeah, we did. We struggled. I mean, it was. And when you start struggling in the leagues and, and you, you lose that bit of love and momentum, yeah, you start to struggle. It's hard to. It's hard to get it. Back a few of the younger lads were over thrown in May, probably yeah. possibly a, quite a bit too early yeah, for yeah. them. But we go back to March 1986, and we get. A first trip to Wembley since the 81 Cup final. Yeah. The full members cup. The, full the day game. after the Old Trafford Manchester derby. Yeah. Did you go straight after the derby down to London or did you go early Sunday morning? Yeah, no, I think we did. We drove down to, we used to stay at a place called the Bell House at uh, Beckinsfield. Because hmm. uh, it was a training ground just over the motorway. So we used to do a bit of work there. Go back, have something to eat, shower and all this. I think we went on the Thursday. We did all we did for Wembley. Thursday, Friday, played, was it Saturday we played? I think yes, it was. Old Trafford yeah. on the Saturday, then yeah. the Wembley final uh, the following day. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a game. You know, bizarre game, wasn't a it? A bizarre game. There was goals coming flying in from every angle. But uh, but still, it was another game at Wembley for the for the fans, yeah? So we drop out of the first division. Mel Mason comes in. Yeah. A lot of the young lads in the squad that time who won the youth cup as few years before. Or well, do you remember them young lads, Paul Lake, Ian Brightwell, and uh, Steve, Steve Redmond. They were they Ian was, Scott was another good player. Yeah, they were the Brighty, Redo. Uh there was like it was like a family because I'd I'd grown up with those lads with Lakey and, and Bob and uh Redo, Ian Scott in Binfield. Um I think Eric was involved there, Eric, Eric Nixon at that time yeah, as well. He was around, yeah. Um so yeah, we struggled. We struggled. Um uh, but uh you know, there was one or two good young players we knew there was yeah. going to be successful. I'm well, sure Roy, you asked loads of times, Paul Lake, Leicester at home, 4 2. The, yeah. the tongue incident was. Yeah. Uh, and then he had a wretched run, unfortunately, I, for I, him. I, I, always, uh, I always think about that game, I really do. You know, Lake was a, um, a special person uh, to me. Uh, and I know he had a, a bad injury, and uh, when I look back, uh, it's similar to Carl, you know, when, when I look back, it's, we, we could have probably done more for him in the way of, you know, he said it in his book about him being looked after on the, on the yeah. flight going to America and he couldn't do that with Swales, I'm afraid. Uh, out of everybody's hands then really, wasn't it? Was, it was, yeah, and you know, I, I know I was the physio, but um, we tried to, to look after him better than what he did get looked after. But unfortunately, you know, as he says in his book, he had to travel back and forward from America and sit in normal seats where he should have been put up to first class. But he couldn't get this this guy to move on any of it like that. He was always one for saving money. So, uh, but as as regarding that team, um, there again, you know, he was going away, travelling away. You could put any two together, they would never yeah. moan. They just get on with it and. Um, it was a great, a great time for us, but not a successful time. So the second season, well, we have, we have the ten one November nineteen eighty seven yeah. of a strange afternoon. Yeah. To well, funny enough, I didn't go to that game. I because of my knee, I'd been playing head tennis, which was a great game we used to play at Mill Road. We used to play it under the stand, and I twisted during this game of head tennis, and we were travelling in the afternoon, and my knee blew up. I got to the hotel, and I thought I can't. Can't wait there on this at all. So um, somebody else looked after the first team on that game. I had to stay in the hotel, and that night I had to go back home to Manchester where they got my knee aspirated. It was full of blood, so I missed that game. Typical city of that era. Then our physios out. <laughs> <laughs> Physio was out. <laughs> <laughs> the, the second season under Mel Mason is a lot better, and we end up going, you know, winning promotion again, nearly blowing it the week before. We could have gone up 
Yeah. Against Bournemouth. Bournemouth, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think I had to go to the toilet two or three times that day because I think we were 3 1 up. 3 0 up at three half time, yeah. 3 0 up, and then I think Inchi made a bad tackle. Um, they played quite, it's about 97 minutes. 97 odd minutes. Quite yeah. unheard of. Yeah, it was 3 2, then. and then I think a ball gets played down to I'm sat in the dugout all the way to the Platte Lane end uh, on the edge inside the box, and he makes a terrible tackle, and it's, yeah. Luther Blissett, I think. Yeah, I think it was, yeah. So we had to wait time. for another week. So the following week we go to Bradford. Yeah. This is Trevor Morley's shirt from the game. Up. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you told me, but I could tell that was Trevor's, yeah. It was, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's another one of them days where you think, excuse me, it's for City, this, because the fans were just incredible, absolutely incredible. A bit like when we played at Blackburn Rovers. Yeah. Incredible. You couldn't couldn't get a ticket for love and the money. They were in every possible angle of the, the ground. And and I remember it was a, a, a bit of a blowy day, sunny day, but the, the pitch was blowing hard. And uh, I remember Whitey knocking this ball down and crossing it for Trevor. And he just knocked it in. And the fans went absolutely bloody mad. And so did we after the game. There was champagne everywhere. Everybody got soaked, including the... Uh, the guy that was interviewing, um, oh, I forget who it was. Rob McCaffrey, I think Rob it is. Rob McCaffrey then, he got cov absolutely covered with the, the juice we used to drink. They just tipped it over his head, throwing sandwiches at him. But yeah, it was a great after-game after drink there. 